for today. Um, I wanted to uh, to speak on on the on the following uh, topics. I wanted to first uh, give you an overview of of how communications is is, is organized uh, in in Brussels. Who the who the different players are, what what role they play, how they go about it. Then zoom a bit in on the, the commission, which is, of course, uh, both the largest player in Brussels, um, but also the one which, for obvious reasons, I, I know the best. And then in the second half is, is where I think it would be interesting to, 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 to look into some of the questions that, uh, that needs addressing. Uh, why is it that communicating from the European Union can be can be difficult what are the challenges and how 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 may we could we could we address some of those <clears throat> you recall this very basic model of political communication from our from our lessons uh, last time uh, where I, I sort of compared the the, the the more autocratic model with a, with a democratic model um, and uh, if we take this model and, and apply that to, to, to the Brussels landscape, it looks something like this. Because obviously on the formal institutional side of things, which is, which is what you have uh, up there in the, the left, uh, left hand corner, uh, there, is the there is the commission, but there is quite a few other players, most significantly, of course, the, the co legislator later, namely uh, Council and Parliament, each which also do their own communication. Um, and there are in connection with, um, with the Council, of course, the particularity that, that, that each individual member state um, is also communicating. Uh, as far as the, as the Parliament is concerned, you would have the individual uh, political groups would have um, communication set up, uh, starting from the the, the largest, uh, the conservative uh, EPP group, um, but likewise for the for the for the social democratic S and D group and the liberal group and, and so on. Um, and the European Parliament itself also has a, a communication department that communicates on behalf of of the entire institution. Um, and then you have various other bodies in Brussels, of course, like the, 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 the Committee of the Regions, the Economic and Social Committee, the Court of Auditors, the Court, uh, and, and so on. And each have, uh, have a communication strand, which, uh, of course, recalling also from last time, is an expression of the particular interest in this and that, that this or that institution represents. On the side of uh, the non-elected organizations, of course, Brussels is uh, par excellence, uh, the, the actually, I think, maybe surpassed by, by Washington, but, but, uh, but certainly on a world scale, one of the cities with the highest concentration of, of lobbyists of, of all kinds of and, and forms and shape, uh, both on the NGO sites, the businesses, uh, individual regions of, of the community uh, who all are in Brussels present with offices and, and agents uh, and who also have uh, a communications activity of, of some sort uh, to try to, to influence political decision making at, at different levels. Um, the green media box is is also a curious one when when we move from the very simplified model to to, to this slightly more uh, applied model because you have a certain subset of media that you would describe as actual Brussels media meaning that they are they are produced in Brussels they also I think often most read inside Brussels inside the what we call the Brussels Beltway um uh, and uh, and 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 is therefore a bit maybe also sometimes a bit of an echo chamber uh in the sense that it's a it's a discussion among people who are all very engaged in in european affairs but not necessarily always uh, entirely a, a reflection of the interest of 
of, of the larger group of citizens that, that, that are not present in Brussels. You have, of course, uh, all, the, all the major national media are present here as well. Uh, and then you both present in Brussels, but of course also present at, at, in their home countries um, and with, with, uh, with European affairs suddenly not playing such a necessarily such a significant role in, in coverage uh, in national media. You have local media, you also have international media. Um, so again, that's quite a um, media is, is very broadly defined here. Uh, and it's of course print, electronic, digital. It's it's it's, it's everything. And then you have you have the citizens, both in the form of, of citizens and of and of voters. Where again, depending on which which media they are they are following, which media they are listening to, they they'll get uh, a, a different story about the EU. And they will get that story both from media, but they would also get it uh, to some extent directly from the European institutions. As, as we will see, the Commission is running various communication campaigns with the aim of, of reaching citizens directly. Uh, and likewise, of course, the NGOs, the business interests and so on also know that influencing voters and influencing citizens is is an indirect fashion of also influencing political decision making. So zooming in a bit on the commission uh, and asking a bit polemically the question, um, who is speaking? I've, um, I've been trying to illustrate that and it may appear slightly overwhelming. And I can tell you from personal experience that, that it is fairly overwhelming and not always entirely clear who um, who is speaking and who you should be speaking to 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 influence the process um, if we look at it first here in in the yellow circle um, the president and her college is of course the the ultimate spokespeople for the commission commissioners, to a large extent talks under the control of the president uh, so as to ensure that the sort of messages that come out are coherent. Obviously you cannot have a, a minister for, for a commissioner for, for climate action coming out in the morning and uh, argue for a, for a for a European Green Deal and the importance of EU leading by reducing emissions, and then a uh, few hours later have a commissioner coming out and uh, arguing in favor of uh, providing state aid to uh, to coal or plants or and. To be honest with you, that was a bit the Brussels that I first met in 2007. Things were not very well coordinated. It was very bottom up. So initiatives appeared a bit out of the blue and often the commission didn't really speak with one voice. So I think that was one of the, the realization that, 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 that President uh, Barroso had when he, when he took office uh, was the importance of of, of the president being more than just one among equals, but actually playing a, um, a presidential role. So the central services, the central service of uh, the commission president is the so-called secretariat general, um, has been reinforced to be uh, much more of a, of a prime minister's office than it, than it used to be. And likewise, both the, as I will speak about the um, uh, DG communication and the spokesperson service has been, has been significantly reinforced. Um, if I go to the next here, the spokesperson service until Junger took office in um, 2014, um, each commissioner had his or her own spokesperson. Again, still reflecting this situation that all commissioners were 
were a bit equal, if you want. Now, since 2014, um, the spokespeople are also rather defined as a college with a chief spokesperson who um, settles the line to take on all the main questions. It has had a positive effect in, in many ways. I think we have also seen the number of, of leaks reduced significantly. One of the ways that commissioners used to work uh, in, in the, the, the former college was if a, dis if a, if a um, proposal was under discussion in the college and a, a commissioner didn't quite agree with it, somehow miraculously or, or, or by mistake, this initiative was leaked to critical parts of the, of the press who would suddenly start writing about, you know, these, some of these rather fake news stories. It was, it was before it, it had been, been, um, been baptized uh, fake news, but essentially the, you would have the, like the, like the, 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 the British tabloid press would, uh, would, uh, would take the proposal and, and pull it out of proportions to the extent that eventually the commission would give up to even table the proposal. And these kinds of leaks, we are seeing much fewer of in, 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 in this new system where, where the president's role has been, been strengthened and the, and the role of the, of the spokesperson service. Um, it's also perhaps worth mentioning here that it is indeed very often the spokesperson who is the interface with the press. Of course, there are press conferences where it's the commissioners appearing, but, but the spokesperson are, are, are very important, both as communicators and as gatekeepers in terms of which are the media which are, which are getting access. On the other side here, you have so-called DG communication. DG communication is a so-called presidential service. So that means they, are, uh, they refer directly to, to the president. Um, other than most other DGs uh, who would refer via an, another commissioner. DG communication uh, develops large scale campaigns, something I will come back to, uh, very much with the purpose of communicating directly with the European citizens. The challenge is often that uh, they, it's still on a global scale, a relatively small communication setup. Um, whereas the commission is a, is a big organization. If we spent, say, 10 million euros on a communication campaign, it's a really, really, really big communication campaign in our world. But if Coca-Cola spends 10 million on a communication campaign, it's, it's nothing. One of the resources, which is not directly a financial one that DGCOM has, is that in each of the EU member states, the commission has a representation, which, which has as its primary function to be the, uh, uh, the, 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 the loudspeaker of the commission in the member states, um, referred to here as, as the reps. Uh, and they are a tool for DG communication um to ensure that campaigns designed uh, centrally are translated and adapted to local audiences in the member states under dg communication you have each of the individual um uh, dgs so you have the dg justice you have dg trade uh, you, you, you know a bit the structure of the commission from, from, from other courses. So you know it's a bit like national ministries you have for each of the different services. And then on top of it, you have then a commissioner who's, who's in charge of, of that particular portfolio. Um, each of those DGs, 
they also have communication departments to promote the specific policy. In the case that I'll briefly touch upon afterwards, namely fisheries and maritime affairs, uh, we have a communications team that, that has as its primary role to communicate on that specific policy. Um, and likewise in all the other DGs. DGCOM has only in the last few years, I say the last, maybe the last five years, DGCOM's mandate, DG communications mandate has been, been strengthened in the sense that DGCOM is supposed to play the role of coordinator for all the individual communications departments of the commission. It's not necessarily an easy task they have um, because in each director general, uh, there's a long tradition for communicating uh, on its own on the matters that concerns that specific DG. And if you go to each DG or each commissioner, you would of course find, as you will find anywhere in the world that we think that what we're doing is the most important thing. Uh, if you go to my colleagues in, um, in, in DG Mare, you would be told that what concerns the ocean, what concerns fisheries, what concerns uh, maritime resources, that's the most important story to be told. And you will find likewise in any of the other DGs. So as I said, DGCOM has this role of trying to coordinate a bunch of uh, communication departments which don't necessarily feel there is a need to be coordinated. We're actually quite happy with the relative degree of autonomy that we have in our work. Uh, so that's that's another challenge that channels that uh, channels that you will you will you will see there. Um, we are communicating directly to our to the citizens through our campaigns, through through our social media channels, but we do not, as a DG, um, as a director general, have the right to speak directly to the press. To speak to the press, we would need to pass through the spokesperson service. Uh, and that again, of course, is um, is part of the attempt to increasingly ensure that despite all the different interests that you would find inside the commission, when we speak publicly, it takes place in a coordinated fashion so that it's, it's, it's the one and the same message that, that is getting across. Finally, uh, the audience here is uh, made it a mix of both uh, stakeholders, uh, institutions, citizens. Uh, it's, it's a very wide type of audience, as I said, and, and <clears throat> we can perhaps come back to this. Um, but of course, it's one of the big challenges when you are as diverse an organization as the commission, which deals with so many different types of questions from environmental policy to uh, industry policy to justice policy. Um, you, and you do that across 27 member states. You don't necessarily just have one audience. You, you really, really have a lot of different audiences. So, um, so it's quite a fragmented picture. And there may be a conflict between or, or maybe not a conflict, some sort of contradiction at least, between on the one hand, having this relative centralization of communication so that a few select messages are transmitted. And on the other hand, you have this very diverse audience which are not necessarily interested in the bigger story or the latest big reform. So that's, that's a real challenge when, when you communicate from such, as I said, from such a diverse institution to such a diverse group of, of, uh, of audiences. How do, you, how do you target your message? Which are the channels that you, that you apply uh, to actually get to the people who, who you want to, to reach? Um, you will recall uh, this 
a very simple model of what is communication uh, from, uh, from when we met uh, two weeks ago. You have the source first, so the sender of the message. But in the case of the EU, well, as we already saw, even within the commission, there are quite a few different sources of messaging here, but also at the highest leadership level. You'd see here both uh, uh, the presidents of, of, of the central bank, of, of the commission, of uh, the European Council and of the European Parliament. These are all presidents and they all have a right to speak to the press. Um, but again, so already just defining who, who's the center of the messages can, can be challenging. The message, uh, one thing is uh, something as simple as the language, of course. I mean, again, the team that I'm headed, we're, we're a relatively small team um, and most of the work we do, unfortunately, is in English. It's partly in French uh, and very rarely in, 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 in other languages unless it's very specific. Um, but of course, uh, we cannot take for granted that when we communicate in, 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 in English, uh, that uh, elderly people in rural Italy uh, <laughs> are listening to us. Uh, so so that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a real challenge in itself uh, when you communicate in such a diverse community as, as ours. And there's the question of the themes, of course. Uh, there are no necessarily, maybe again, contrary to a, a national debate where you have these more unifying themes that the whole nation is preoccupied with a current political issue. It is, it is rarely so on a, on a European scale that people in North of Finland are interested in the same thing as uh, people in, in, in South of Spain. Uh, so, so how we select those topics which, can, uh, which has, a, has a good following. We discussed the media landscape a bit, which is indeed quite a fragmented one. And then the more philosophical question, of course, of whether there is uh, at all a European public um, because not only uh, is the, is, uh, we are fragmented in terms of messages and channels, but again, the audience is also a very, uh, a very fragmented one. Uh, and uh, finally, of course, the, the feedback. How do we know on the one hand that citizens are hearing what we say and what are the possibilities for citizens to react, to respond? Uh, apart from uh, national EP elections, but but uh, it it may again be for something happening in Brussels. If as a as a citizen in a member state, it's it, it's quite far away. And how how do we react 